Hi guys, Blackbox here. Another video and today I will be talking about how close today's flight simulators have become to reality. And for this comparison I am using X-Plane 11, um, also the Flight Factor A320 um, as an add-on. And the sceneries uh, you'll see today are either payware sceneries for the airports um, or the free ortho for XP terrain um, sceneries. I'll be posting a complete list of all the add-ons that are used here down in the comment section below. If you are interested, have a look there. So what's the point of today's video? Well, I'm going to do a flight from Palm Springs to Albuquerque and we will be doing this as close as possible to real-world procedures. So all the uh, procedures, all the setups, um, I'll be doing as closely as possible to how it's done in real life. And that way you will have a pretty good impression um, of what pilots do in the flight decks. Um, I'll also be using real life ATC communications. I'm using the Pilot Edge network, which should give a nice immersion uh, into the flight as well. Now be aware also that I'm not using any specific airline standard operating procedure here. So I am aware that different airlines do things differently regarding uh, the setups, regarding the briefings, uh, the approaches, etc, etc. Right, enough of the introduction. Let's now get into the cockpit of the Flight Factor A320 and start our preparations for the flight from Palm Springs to Albuquerque. Okay, so let's get started. Um, we're entering the flight deck and the first thing that pilots uh, do or the captain does when he gets into the flight deck of the aircraft for the first time of the day, then he will check the technical logbook. And so today we can see that uh, we have no handicap items. Um, handicap items are um, items that affect the operational capability of the airplane. For example, regarding performance restrictions, um, fueling, uh, cargo loading, um, approach capabilities, that sort of thing. Now, important item we have today, an engine one vibration indication that um, is still intermittent US. Um, that means if we see that problem arising, um, see that fault arising, then um, we already know that uh, maintenance is aware of that uh, fact and um, it doesn't really affect the safe conduct of the flight and so it's not handicapping us um, but it's important to know about. Now a minor item here is uh, also present and it says that rudder travel limiter number one fault on ground and after circuit breaker reset uh, it was normal ops again. Um, that again is just an informational kind of um, item where where if it should again arise um, and we again have to do a reset then um, it might become an important item meaning that maintenance has uh, to look at that system uh, more closely and maybe uh, repair it. Okay now we're aware of the technical status of the aircraft. Um, next thing to do is to look at the flight planning um, weather situation and that sort of thing to determine the required fuel quantity. So for the flight planning, usually pilots these days get these either in the paper format um, to look at, so many many pages of printout, or if you have a more modern aircraft um, with an electronic flight bag, just like this one, um, that has also wireless or internet connectivity, you will get the flight planning actually directly downloaded into your EFB. That's what I've simulated today. And so uh, we have our JetBlue 711 flight number, the correct date, and the correct departure and destination airports. So the flight time is gonna be one hour, 23 minutes. Um, we are planning for flight level 370, uh, depends maybe 350. Um, we'll have a look at that later on. The alternate is going to be Las Vegas. So we have the um, airport information regarding the distance that we have to fly, the proposed flight level, 
um, the time it'll take to that airport, um, etc. And the routing uh, as well uh, for the diversion from Albuquerque to Las Vegas. So we'll get down, uh, before we do the flight planning itself or the, the fuel planning itself, um, we'll have a look generally at the weather situation. So Albuquerque presently has uh, northwesterly winds, uh, 16 gusts, 25, uh, 25 degrees. Uh, good visibility, um, only few clouds, 30,000 feet. So very fine, dry weather there. The forecast itself uh, not showing anything um, out of the ordinary. So the landing there is uh, pretty much assured. Uh, the alternate Las Vegas has a um, bit more cloud, however, it's still very high level cloud, good visibility, uh, only very light winds, 26 degrees, and the forecast itself, apart from the wind picking up a bit more out of the southwest, um, not really thing out of anything out of the ordinary. So again, uh, nothing that uh, worries us too much about a possible um, diversion to Las Vegas. Palm Springs is um, quite good as well. We have uh, wind out of northwest, 13 gusts, 20, good visibility, 36 degrees, so no clouds at the moment. And the forecast, well, visibility going down just a little bit, not much though. And the wind will remain out of the uh, northwest. Here we have the waypoint list uh, with the winds and different flight levels um, that we can use. Um, for the uh, insertion of the weather data. Next up, the NOTAMs, Notice to Airmen. Um, these are information regarding the airports. Um, for example, uh, quite often you will see some information about obstacles, right? There's a crane here in the way somewhere um, that will be taken into account for landing or, or takeoff performance. Um, here it says COM approach remote transit um, is a uh, frequency 20.225. Um, if there is anything regarding the runways, uh, if the runways are shortened, if you have an ILS frequency not working, etc., etc., that will be uh, detailed here in the uh, NOTAMs. So Palm Springs is fine. Uh, we look at destination Albuquerque. And sometimes these NOTAMs can be very long. Um, sometimes you have to read through a lot of stuff. Um, and yeah, you just have to take your time doing that. Um, it's in a code that obviously if you're not tr trained to it, to reading it, then um, it'll take a bit longer. Um, experienced pilots very quickly scan through and uh, you know they will pick up certain um, abbreviations like taxiway. Uh, taxiway obviously is important um, to know about. Um, Right, so things like airdrops, well, ATC would tell us about these. Uh, firefighting aircraft training, okay, that's fine as well. Uh, we're aware in the back of our minds about that. But again, I do expect air traffic control to let us know if there's any conflicting traffic. I mean, we are flying IFR, so. Again, some more taxiways uh, that are either closed or being worked on. Um, yeah, in the in the quiet moment uh, during cruise flight, uh, you can, uh, have a look at the the taxi chart and then compare um, the, the closed taxiways with that. Now you can see here for example we have a runway closed, um, obviously some work going on, approach light system, PAP US, VAS US. Um, important thing here to note is the time at which these um, take place. So the time at the moment does not affect our flight. Um, we're outside of these hours um, and so nothing to worry about right now. Um, ILS 08 is US um, and the outer marker is decommissioned as well. Okay, that's fine. Uh, regarding the wind, we have more like uh, westerly uh, landings, so 08 is not going to affect us today. Las Vegas, some uh, departure procedures not authorized. Departure, departure, departure. Okay, nothing that worries us at all. Now we get to the uh, weather data. We have um, an overview regarding the significant weather. So here's uh, Palm Springs, Albuquerque, and then our alternate Las Vegas. Yeah, I know. I don't know why uh, Sim Brief has taken Las Vegas as our alternate. Uh, it doesn't Let's say for operation reasons, uh, if we have to divert, um, our company would like us to fly to Las Vegas. 
Um, information regarding jet streams. So we have a jet stream here just south of our routing at level 410 is the axis. Um, it has a node 1 telling us we have to expect some turbulence, uh, motor turbulence between 290 and 430. Uh, apart from that, it's clear, nothing uh, other than ordinary. These dashed lines signif signify the area where that turbulence might occur. So we're in the northern part of that area. Hence, we might get some light turbulence or motor turbulence from time to time. We'll listen out to other aircraft um, and also, well, we would brief our cabin crew that they might have to expect some turbulence during their service. Here's the wind chart in the upper level 340. Um, so we have tailwind all the way to Albuquerque, which is nice, pushing us along. So um, one of these lines signifies 10 knots. If it's half a line, so a smaller line, then it's 5 knots. So we can see this would be like uh, 45 knots. If you have a little triangle uh, like this one, that means it's uh, 50 knots plus 10 plus 5. That would be 65 knots of wind component. Uh, minus 50 tells you the temperature at that flight level 340. And uh, yeah, that's about it. That's the information we get out of this chart. And then here we have the vertical profile chart showing us the um, obstacles in our way. Um, so, yeah, some mountains at first, and uh, we have for pretty much level grounds, and then slowly but surely the uh, elevations start picking up again um, and you can see that Albuquerque is definitely higher than Palm Springs. So now that we have a good overview of our flight um, we can make a decision on the on the fuel. Now Albuquerque, I'm not sure about the traffic situation there, sometimes you might get uh, delay vectors or I don't know. Um, don't expect big holdings, so I've just topped up the extra fuel up to 600 kilograms here, um, giving us an extra 15 minutes. And uh, the plant takeoff fuel now is 7.888, so 7.9 tons, plus 200 taxi, so that will be about 8.1 ton uh, tons of block fuel. And that's uh, the value we will tell our fuel to put into the aircraft. Now that process uh, is being done by both pilots and both pilots then decide on the fuel they would like to take on and so once that's completed the tasks separate and so one of the crew members for example will now check the emergency equipment in the cockpit, he'll check the electronic uh, circuit breakers, he will check the door lock functions and he'll make sure that all the necessary documentations are uh, in the flight deck. Then he'll uh, go outside and uh, perform the outside check of the aircraft. So roughly this would be about 45 minutes before off blocks. Uh, that's what I've put in uh, T minus 45 <laughs> and the top left corner there. And uh, so the pilot flying, uh, in this case the captain um, does his cockpit preparation procedure. And um, after he's done that, he will then go and um, put all the necessary data into the FMS. Now, first of all, uh, the IRS units have to be aligned. Um, then we look at the, all the panels, uh, make sure the light switches are in the correct positions. Um, Air conditioning system is uh, correctly configured. The electric panel, the fuel panel, will do the engine fire warning test and the APU fire warning test. Right hand side of the overhead panel, just make sure that all the uh, lights and the push buttons are extinguished, no fault lights, and uh, all the covers are in place. So then we get to the left side, uh, well the oxygen mask uh, can't be tested yet here in the flat factor 320, but usually that will be done. Then you would adjust your armrest um, so that you can comfortably use the flat stick, then adjust the rudder pedals to the uh, center pedestal, uh, make sure the comm panel is uh, correctly configured, usually interphone switch is on, and uh, make sure the radar is off, 
um, the speed brake lever is in the retracted position. The start switches uh, are off, the rudder trim is zero, parking brake is set and the emergency gear extension handle is stowed, then the flaps are up. Make sure that the ATC transponder is uh, configured correctly and then we'll check the VHF2 panel is also correctly set. Right, that completes uh, the preparations here. And so now we're going to uh, the FMS preparation. And for this I use the diff-rip model. So first of all we check that the data is up to date, which it is. Then we'll go to the init A page and uh, fill out all the necessary data there. So we're going from Palm Springs to Albuquerque. Our alternate is going to be Las Vegas. Flight number JetBlue 711. Cost index is uh, 5. Then we'll set the cruising level, filed at 370. Um, just wondering whether or not I should first of all try 350. Uh, well, no, I'll tell you what, we'll go with uh, 370 first of all. And then later on uh, we'll see how the aircraft climbs. Uh, and maybe if the performance isn't that good up at that level, then we might stick with 350. And also depending on the uh, the wind that we have up there. Trouble pause is at uh, average 41,000 feet. Then we go and have a look at the performance data. However, um, you can do this a little bit later. I've just got used to doing this uh, here in the flight sims a bit sooner. Um, so the B page gives you all the weight data, takeoff weight data, the fuel data, and so on. Next up is the F, the flight plan. And so for departure today, we are going to take 3-1 left. And that's the Cathedral 1 departure. Insert that. So now that uh, the departure route is inserted, we'll just have a quick look through it. Um, so it's straight ahead until we pass 268 radial from Palm Springs. Then it's a right turn um, back towards uh, Palm Springs. And then outbound to Emrut. Then right turn again back to Palm Springs and then we proceed on course our routing. And from Palm Springs according to the flight plan we'll be going uh, via the Victor 370 to Tango November Papa Then it's direct to Papa Kilo Echo. And then direct Capno. And from Capno, it's going to be the Kirky 3 arrival into Albuquerque. So checking again, Tango, November Papa to Papa Kilo Echo, and then Capno. Well, that's all correct, so arrival. And we are planning for the Arnav approach. Let's have a look. So that should be the Arnav Yankee runway 21. Here it is. Uh, we are going via the Kirky 3 and transition is going to be Foxer. That's all correct. So flight plan, let's scroll down. And we have one discontinuity, but we can check that on the arrival chart and we can see that from Capno it's direct to Kirky. So we just clear out the discontinuity. And there we go. So now the routing is uh, complete. Next up is the differ, the R for radios. And so we'll have a look for the departure route and we can see that we will need Palms Springs, obviously for the departure, Papa Sierra Papa. And then we're proceeding to 
Tango November Papa, and we'll put that on VOR2. Alright, um, next up would be init B, but we've already filled it out, and so now we'll go to the P for performance. And I've already prepared the performance sheet, and so we'll just quickly glance through everything. So we're Palm Springs, 3 1 left, have the correct engine type, and the weather is inserted correctly. Take away 61.8 tons, air conditioning is off and the ice obviously is off. And so we get to the, the results. So config 1, we already know that the trim will be up 0, 0.0, so pretty much neutral. Then we have flex 65, giving us 590 something meters stop margin. The speeds V1, 142, V2, uh, sorry, VR is 142 and V2 is 143. Transition 18,000 feet in the US. And for the NADP procedure, so noise abatement departure procedure will take NADP 1. And so the thrust reduction will be at 2,000 feet bar row and the acceleration will be 3,500 feet bar row. And that equals to 1,500 and 3,000 uh, 3, feet above the ground. Once again, so that's the performance page filled out as well. However, the one thing that's missing is the engine out acceleration altitude. That's going to be 2,000 feet in this case. And 3 1 left, the procedure says 1,000 feet, right turn, thermal VR, and hold. And do not exceed V2 plus 15 during initial turn. Lastly, I'll just copy the secondary flight plan. However, this function isn't properly inserted yet um, in the FMS here in the Flight Factor 320. And uh, that completes the preparations in the FMS. So now typically it will be about 30 minutes prior to off blocks. And uh, depending on how full the flight is, that would be the time when uh, the boarding process of passengers will be started. So cockpit preparation wise, uh, we have pretty much finished everything. That is assuming the first officer has also uh, adjusted his uh, armrest, um, his rudder pedals, checked his instruments and that sort of thing. And so that is completed. Um, however, in the Airbus 320, there is no cockpit uh, checklist or cockpit preparation checklist, just like in the uh, Boeing 737, for example. So the first checklist you will read is uh, the before start checklist, but for that it's a bit early. And in, as a matter of fact, now would be a good time to brief the other crew member um, regarding the departure procedures and so on. And since the captain is the pilot flying, he will do the complete briefing regarding the departure route, regarding engine out and regarding rejected takeoff. Okay, so for the departure briefing, we are on the A320, November 763, Judith Bravo, as our registration technically. Only minor uh, and uh, one important item, we've talked about that, nothing that influences the safe conduct of the flight. Um, then we've ordered 7.8. 9 tons of fuel that is correctly inserted and also distributed correctly. That will give us uh, an extra fuel of about 6 yeah, kilograms, so 15 minutes extra time at our destination before we have to make a decision on the diversion. Our departure runway is going to be 3 1 left, and for our departure routing, um, we are flying the Cathedral 1 departure. It is a conventional departure, 
meaning that we will use headings, radials, VOR stations, etc. And so we're going to continue on the heading, first of all, 310 until we pass 268 radial from Palm Springs VOR. And then we'll turn right direct to warm towards uh, Palm Springs after Palm Springs unless we get any other instructions we'll proceed uh, M route then turn right again back to Palm Springs and then we'll continue on our airway Victor 370 to 29 Palms. Sometimes we do get um, depending on our altitude we do get direct routings uh, we'll see how it goes today. Notum wise uh, nothing special here in uh, Palm Springs for our departure Performance-wise, we've calculated um, with a takeoff weight of 61.8 tons. That has given us a flaps 1 takeoff, flex 65 degrees, the speeds 142, 142, 143. Transition is at 18,000 feet, NADP 1 departure, and the engine out acceleration is at 2,000 feet bar row. On the RATNAV page, we've set uh, Palm Springs and Tango November Papa. For the engine out procedure, um, we will continue first of all straight out heading 310 until we reach 1000 feet bar row and then we'll turn right direct towards uh, Tango Romeo Mike VR and hold there. Important that we do not exceed V2 plus 15 during our initial turn and the engine out acceleration will be at 2000 feet. Now regarding our rejected takeoff procedure, um, we have a stop margin of 598 meters, that is plenty. So on the low speed regime, um, before the takeoff inhibit phase starts, we can pretty much abort for all the cautions, warnings. Um, once the inhibit phase has started, um, we can abort nevertheless for all the warnings and cautions that uh, get through. And up to uh, V1, I will abort of course for um, anything related to aircraft not controllable, any engine faults or ATC calling us and telling us to abort the takeoff. One thing also to, uh, or one thing that is uh, worth mentioning is the terrain situation here in Palm Springs. So for our engine out case, for example, um, turning right towards uh, thermal and that's all fine. We will be staying in the um, white area here. Um, otherwise, terrain is very high. We have MSAs of 12,100 here in the west. Um, the northeast, we have uh, 6,900 feet. And um, southeast of thermal, uh, terrain is also a bit higher at 7,900 feet. But as I mentioned, as long as we stay on the engine out procedure or the departure routes, um, meeting all the requirements for our climb gradients, uh, we will be clear of the terrain. Right, 10 minutes uh, prior to off blocks, it's about time uh, to get our departure clearance. Palm Springs uh, clearance from JetBlue 711. Information Foxtrot request clearance Albuquerque. JetBlue 711. Palm Springs clearance cleared to Albuquerque Airport, Cathedral 1, departure Palm Springs as followed. Maintain 7000, departure frequency 126.7, squawk 2207. JetBlue 711 is cleared to Albuquerque. The Cathedral 1 departure, Palm Springs as filed, climb 7000. Departure frequency 126.7, squawk 2207. JetBlue 711, read back, right? All right, so no uh, surprises here. We did get the Cathedral 1 departure. Um, that's the one we have briefed. And so all that's uh, needed to be done now is uh, we'll make sure we have 7,000 set in the FCU and we will set the squawk now to 207. All right, three minutes to go to off blocks and here comes our load sheet that has been prepared by our ramp agent and load control. So we have the correct registration. Um, 
making sure we have the correct aircraft here in the load sheet. Then departure airport Palm Springs, that's correct. The load, so the traffic load is 12.8 tons. Let me just move the MCU out of the way. So passengers and cargo, both of these make uh, the traffic load, which is 12.8. Zero fuel weight, 54.1. And so that's correctly entered into the MCVU. Have a look at the CG. That's set 29.8. That's also correct. And within limits, block fuel 7.9 tons. That gives us a takeoff weight of 61.8 tons. And for 61.8 tons, we have a CG of about 28.7. And that gives us a trim pretty much of zero. So that's all correct. All right, cross-checking again on the load sheet. Trim 0, 0.0, all fine. Crew 2 and 4. Actual passenger numbers are 16 in the business, 82 in economy. And the load distribution in the cargo holds, that is also cross-checked with the actual loading. That's all correct. So the cross check is completed and verified. Right, we are ready for pushback. All doors are closed, and so we'll start up the APU first of all. Now, obviously, if it's a hot day, it uh, would have been performed a uh, early bit earlier. Fuel pumps are on. APU is running, so we'll disconnect the ground power, get some air bleed going, tell the ground crew to remove the ground power. There we go. Get the taxi chart ready. And while the pushback truck is uh, driving up, we'll put the beacon on and then read the checklist. The four star checklist. Cockpit preparations have been completed. Signs are on and auto. Fuel quantity 7,880 kilograms. Altimeters 29.84 at 500 feet. That's uh, to the line, below the line. Windows, doors are okay. closed. Doors and hatches are closed. Ready to Beacon connect. is on. Thrust levers idle and the park brake is set. Okay, so we allowed to start the engines. We'll just have a look at the APU bleed. The fuel pumps are on, and so good to go. Engine start. Just uh, wait for the start pressure to build up, the Fardex to get powered. There we go. All set. Engine two start.
right, start a cutout, and so we can start engine one. Okay, both engines started, so we'll do the after start flow. APU bleed off, APU off, flaps one, spoilers armed, start switch to normal. Then we will need to set the or check the flag controls for left, for right, neutral, fall down, fall down, fall up, uh, neutral, the rudder, for left, full right, neutral, and the trim is already set at 0.0. .0. Okay, so we wait with the checklist until the steering pin is disconnected. That is now the case. So the after start checklist, engine anti ice is off, ECAM status is clear, and the trim it should be 0, 0.0. Here it so is, is 0, 0.0 and, and 0. That's the after start the checklist right. completed. Now in real life, before you release the park brake you make sure that you do see the all clear signal from your pushback driver. And he usually has the steering pin also in his hand. So we can move a little bit forward toward the, uh, towards the um, next dashed line there. That signifies that uh, that will be the controlling side of the apron, i.e. air traffic control. Gives you clearance to taxi um, into that area. And so before reaching, we have to contact ground control. Palm Springs ground, JetBlue 711 on the apron at Bravo Holding Short Whiskey, request taxi. JetBlue 711, uh, Palm Springs ground, runway 31 left taxi via Whiskey Alpha. Whiskey Alpha, 31 left, uh, JetBlue 711. So no big surprises there. I'll just turn right here onto Whiskey and then taxi to the end and that's where taxiway alpha will lead us to the threshold of runway 31 left as soon as the cabin has finished their preparations we can select auto brake max and also check the takeoff config and then make sure everything is prepared for our departure. And so before start checklist, flag controls checked, flaps are 1 plus F, takeoff speed, flex settings. There we have 142 as V1. 
There it is. VR is um, 142 as well, and V2 143. And the flex temperature is uh, 65 degrees. It can be more takeoff, no blue. And so that's down to the line. So we reached the threshold of 3 1 left. Just gonna set the parking brake really quickly. And then make sure we've prepared everything. And then we'll ask for the takeoff clearance. Palm Springs Tower from JetBlue 711. Holding short 3 1 left at Alpha, ready for IFR departure. JetBlue 711, Palm Springs Tower, wind 32013, gust 16, runway 3 1 left, clear for takeoff. 3 1 left, clear takeoff, JetBlue 711. Delta right, so we switch off the packs, get the strobe lights on, the landing lights on, release the parking brake, and then read below the line. So take off runway, 3 1 left, full length, and the packs are off. E4 takeoff checklist completed. Right, just make sure that the approach sector is clear, nobody there. And so we'll line up and take off. Wind is uh, pretty much from the front, a bit gusty but not too bad and so uh, everything is as expected no changes starting the stopwatch all right take off And here we have Munflex 65 SRS and auto thrust is blue. Thrust set. One hundred knots. V1 rotate. Positive climb, gear up. Autopilot one. So here we have the thrust reduction altitude. Lever climb is blinking. So two notches back and we have thrust climb. But the acceleration phase has not started yet. That's why we still have SRS. However, since we've uh, reduced the thrust to climb first, we can now select the packs back on, switch the air conditioning on. Now we have the acceleration phase, climb, alt blue. JetBlue 711, uh, contact departure, see ya. Departure, JetBlue 711, thanks. Alright, so we're outside of his airspace now, and let's go over to the departure controller. So called departure, good afternoon. JetBlue 711, 4500, climbing 7000. JetBlue 711, so called departure, rate of contact, Climatane 1 3000. Climatane 1 3000, JetBlue 711. S speed, gonna have to uh, select flaps zero, spoilers uh, disarmed, and the no gear landing lights off. And we don't forget to uh, dial in the new cleared altitude, 1 3000. JetBlue 711 after Palm Springs flight 090, contact Los Angeles Center 126.35, see ya. After Palm Springs, we'll be heading 090, contact 12635, thanks, JetBlue 711. Epic 55, Victor Whiskey, Los Angeles Center, Roger. Right, 1225, short way contact departure.
1901 Hotel, Fulton Town, on right base, runway 24, could land. Right, and left turn, however, we have to maintain uh, heading 0, line of 0 uh, after right Palm Springs, so that's what we'll do. Now we're heading an open climb. Uh, the control is very busy, so I'm just waiting my turn right now to uh, call in. And so call JetBlue 711, good afternoon. 11500, climbing 13000 on a heading of 090. JetBlue 711, off center center, climbing team level 230. I'm at another 230 JetBlue 711. JetBlue 711, clear the right Parker. Clear the right Parker, JetBlue 7-11. Right, so now we're going back on course, our routing that we have filed. So direct to Parker, now we're in NAV mode again. Always make sure that uh, whenever you change something um, regarding the autopilot modes, that you cross-check with the primary flight display that the modes that you uh, you have called for are actually active. Jetblue 711 contact, Los Angeles Center, 133.55 CR. 133.55 CR, Jetblue 711. Los Angeles Center from Jetblue 711, passing 200, climbing 230. Stop with 6422, uh, Limburg clearance, Roger, stand by. Jetblue 711, Los Angeles Center, climbing tank level 350. Climb maintain level 350, JetBlue 711. All right, so uh, we've been pretty busy with um, air traffic control right now. Um, that's pretty normal when you're climbing up um, to your cruising level. Once you get in the upper sectors, uh, things quieten down. And then uh, you can have uh, a coffee and a chat with your, uh, your other crew member. So where are we? Okay, we're passing Parker right now. 
we'll continue on the airway to our next fix. And we have a good uh, tailwind today helping us uh, towards Albuquerque, which is uh, very nice indeed. Blue 711, contact Albuquerque Center, 134.32, see ya. 134.32, Jet Blue 711, see ya. Albuquerque Center, Jet Blue 711, passing 325, climbing 350. Jet Blue 711, Albuquerque Center, Roger. Right, there's no need to request any shortcuts right now since we're on a pretty much direct course towards Albuquerque but should there be some potential to shortcut somewhere do ask air traffic control they will uh, help you whenever they can Now, having reached the flight level, the cruising level, um, there are certain things that uh, pilots should be doing now. Uh, first of all, check the overhead panel, make sure everything uh, is still set correctly. And then have a look at the ECAM system pages. Just make sure all the parameters are in normal ranges. Here's the cabin altitude, for example, differential pressure. All looking uh, good. Electric power distribution right now. Trend one has more load. Uh, that's normal because they have more systems to supply in normal configurations. Hydraulic. You'll see the green hydraulic quantity drop down usually during cruise flight. Uh, that's because of something called cold soak. So if you do see that, uh, don't be alarmed. All right, fuel distribution still good. Everything's uh, balanced nicely. No uh, signs of a fuel leak. Cabin temperatures, make sure passengers have it nice and cozy. So uh, once you've uh, looked through the ICAM pages, it's then a very good idea to have a look at the fuel situation. So let's do a fuel check. So the last fix we just crossed is Parker at uh, 0132 UTC. So 20 minutes after departure. And we can see Parker, we should have crossed 21 minutes after departure, so that's uh, pretty much spot on. And we're supposed to have 6.4 tons in the tanks, also very, very good. Uh, we had 6.4 at Parker as well, so uh, also um, very nice indeed. And so that's what I find generally. Um, I'm doing most of my flight planning these days with simbrief.com and um, these values um, are very very accurate um, so uh, using if you use live weather um, and then the the actual weather in Simbrief um, it does coincide uh, very nicely all right so the cruise phase obviously is a phase where pilots can uh, relax and I get asked uh, quite often on my streams uh, what do pilots do during cruise flight? Uh, are they allowed to watch uh, videos, films? Um, are they allowed to read magazines, books, etc., etc.? So um, the answer is it depends. Um, obviously, I've not come across anybody um, that told me they were watching films in the cockpit during cruise flight. Um, I think that uh, has to do with the personal attitude. Um, how you see yourself as a professional um, and being responsible for 
so many lives on board and um, hence you make sure that you concentrate on your primary tasks and these are as always aviate navigate communicate and so you just make sure that you do not fly inadvertently into any thunderstorm clouds um, you do um, notice anything going wrong with the aircraft at the very early stage like a fuel leak for example you make sure that you stay in contact with the appropriate air traffic control services otherwise you might get um, some unwanted company from fighter jets and also regarding navigation especially when you're over the North Atlantic um, it is just so vitally important to monitor the uh, the accuracy of the navigation make sure you are flying towards the correct um, waypoints um, and so on now of course some pilots will argue that uh, reading a book or reading a magazine will help them um, to stay awake uh, so they, they think that's better than looking at the window and uh, at some point fall asleep and that's understandable um, so again it uh, all depends on the personal preference however that should not um, cause a lack of attention to all the uh, important duties on the flight deck personally I've always found it very helpful if you have a colleague next to you that you can have uh, good conversations with and that has always uh, helped me stay awake now during cruise flight uh, it's always very advisable to make sure you always have a emergency airfield around you that you can reach um, in case for example you have uh, fire or smoke on board um, you have a medical um, situation one of the passengers or the crew gets sick and needs urgent medical attention um, so it is advisable to in advance to get some weather infos for possible diversion airports around you and so here we have for example Phoenix that be very good airport uh, Flagstaff um, yeah so on the route just have a look plan ahead and uh, do not be overwhelmed with workload in case you do need to make a quick decision while we are flying along here in cruise flight um, and since we are doing a RNF approach today into um, Albuquerque. Let's talk a little bit about what RNAV and what RNP stands for and what it actually means. So by definition RNAV is a method of navigation which permits an aircraft's operation on any desired flight path within the coverage of station referenced navigation aids or within the limits of the capability of self-contained aids or a combination of these so that simply means that the path the flight path does not require to be from a ground fixed nav aid like VOR or NDB but can be point to point um, with a either GPS defined waypoint or a waypoint defined by radial DMEs the important thing is though that the aircraft track center line the actual track center line stays within a limit of plus and minus one nautical mile if it's for example RNF1 and so the aircraft's track center line has to stay within one nautical mile left and right 95% of the total flight time so by definition the total system error and that's the sum of path definition error, the flight technical error, and the navigation system error. Those combined, that sum in RNF1 is not allowed to exceed plus minus one nautical mile from track centerline. At the moment, we're flying en route, and so in the US, we have RNF2 at the moment, that's required. And uh, we can see here in the MCDU progress page the required um, sector is 2 nautical miles so TSE maximum 2 nautical miles 
And on the right hand side, we can see that we have GPS updating, so GPS primary updating, and the estimated accuracy is high. And by value, the estimated maximum total system error is going to be 0.08 nautical miles. So let's now talk about RNP-1. So just as RNF-1, the RNP-1 states that the aircraft TSE needs to remain within plus minus one nautical mile 95% of the flight time. However, additionally, the system also needs to stay within a plus minus two nautical mile limit for 99.999% of the flight time. And so also a key difference between RNF and RNP is the required onboard performance monitoring and alerting system for RMP operations. And hence the RMP is a subset of RNF with additional system requirements. And here in the picture you can see what is meant by that. Um, so you have the TSE max 1 nautical mile left and right of center line and then additional sector uh, containment limit if you like of two miles left and right of center line. Now the neat thing is uh, that GNSS, so the Global Navigation Satellite System, um, provides accuracy performance monitoring and alerting, um, so which by definition makes it an RP capable system. So you'll find the uh, definitions RNF and RP not only in approach charts, but also um, in en route areas um, depending on the region of the world, it may either be BRNF, PRNF, RNF1, RNF2, or RNP4, or RNP10. So RNP has kind of evolved um, around the new performance-based navigation concept, and this concept differs um, from previous concepts where um, operators are not forced to have certain equipment installed in their aircraft. Um, it's more a case where um, the aircraft has to meet certain performance um, requirements to accuracy. And as long as these accuracies are met, whatever the updating service may be, or whatever the equipment updating service may be, as long as you fulfill these um, performance-based navigation requirements, then you are allowed to fly your aircraft in these airspaces and these approaches. Okay, I'll now give a quick example um, of what happens when the measured or the calculated accuracy actually goes above the required, um, what warnings are created, and for this I have to use the FS Labs A320 since uh, this feature is not really working properly yet here um, in the Flat Factor 320. Um, one thing I've also not uh, mentioned yet is that the required um, navigation precision is um, automatically adjusted by the system usually. But in an uh, RNF or RP approach, you have to make sure that the required navigation precision, the RNP, is uh, entered manually. So, for example, here I'm going to have to enter 0.3 nautical miles manually for this approach. And there we go. And so let's have a look at uh, what happens if then the estimated accuracy actually goes above the required. And here we go, you get a message on the MCDU NAV accuracy downgrad and also on the navigation display the same message NAV accuracy downgrad. And we can see that the estimated is now 14 point something miles while required 0 0.3. So what does this mean for the approach today? Well, we are flying the RNF RNP 
Yankee runway 21 at least that what that's what we're planning and you have to be careful with the requirements usually you'll find them in the field with all the remarks so where it says transition level etc transition altitude here it says one authorization is required then a radial fix um, function is required which we do have here in the um, A320 GPS is required <coughs> for updating so that's very important as well and the radar is also required so that the air traffic controller can follow your approach on his radar screen and uh, by doing so he can act as a backup function um, in case you are deviating too far off the um, required track and so on the bottom of the approach plate you will see the required RNP value and so as expected in this case it is RNP 0.3 now be aware there are some approaches where it can even go down to RNP 0.1 um, but for us today, it's going to be um, 0 0.3. JetBlue 711, contact Albuquerque Center, 134.6 today. 134.6, JetBlue 711, bye-bye. Albuquerque Center from JetBlue 711, maintaining level 350. JetBlue 711, Albuquerque Center, good afternoon. Descend via the Kirky 3 arrival, runway 3 transition. JetBlue 711 uh, via the Kirky 3 and 03 transition, uh, the descent. And due to the wind, if traffic permits, we would appreciate the Arn of Yankee uh, 2 1. JetBlue 711, Roger, I'll keep that in mind and follow your request. October 5882, descend and maintain 3000 in the airport, 11 o'clock, 7 miles. Okay, so um, he gave me runway 03, but um, personally, due to the wind, I ask for runway 21. Uh, that's a very legitimate thing to do. Um, and if air traffic control can um, coordinate that, they will, of course, do so. Sun is uh, about to disappear behind the horizon there. We're flying away from the sun, so it's going to get dark very quickly now. Chapu 711, descend via the Kirky 3, arrival, runway 21 transition. By the Kirky 3, 21 transition, thank you, uh, Chapu 711. So, as uh, requested, we've now been given the Kirky 3 arrival and the 21 transition. And so now we can actually have a look at the FMS programming, make sure that all the waypoints, all the restrictions regarding altitudes and um, speeds are inserted correctly in the FMS. So what we do is check all the waypoints now, so Kirky, max speed 270, uh, between level 280 and 210. Uh, next is going to be Elera and that's going to be between flight level 180 and 14,000 feet. Then we have X marks 250 knots maximum and 11,000 or above. Then we have Amra 10,000 or above. And then we have Foxer, the f uh, initial approach fix for the RNF approach runway 21. And Foxer, we have to be 210 knots and exactly at 10,000 feet. Then we skip over to the Arnav approach plate and here we can see Foxer 10,000 feet mandatory, max 210 indicated airspeed. Then Big Eye is um, 8,000 or above 205 knots maximum. Then on the next leg 7,200 feet maximum to Kefir um, and after that 6,600 to Kanye and that's the final approach point. So that's where we will have final approach um, active and then start the final approach towards the runway. 
and we have to check that it's a three degree gl uh, glide slope so three degree program slope and the distance four miles that's also correct so which again Kanya 6600 feet three degree glide profile yeah, that coincides with the chart four miles from final approach point to the runway that's uh, also correct in the FMS here then a minimum 5760 feet round it up we'll enter that into the approach uh, page So 5760 MDA, minimum descent altitude. And then we have to check the missed approach as well. <coughs> and that will go as follows. Climb to 8000 feet. On track 214 to Humku. So that's... Uh, correctly insert then right turn to Wapfema then on track 315 to Albuquerque VOR and hold so Wapfema Albuquerque 8000 feet that's all correctly inserted so we can actually fly the mist approach in NAV mode as well perfect So it's about time we enter the information for the approach page. So we have the latest ATIS um, information hotel now. So we'll go to the performance page and then approach page. And we'll enter the current QNH 3006. Temperature 25 degrees. The wind 31017. So a bit of crosswind. And the minimum is already inserted. Transition altitude is 18,000 feet. So now we'll go to the RATNAV page. Let's have a look what we need. Well, for the missed approach, we'll set Albuquerque VR into VR1. And that pretty much completes... Uh, the preparations apart from the auto brake setting and we can see that the landing distance available is uh, to one there it is so 3084 meters of landing distance available so that's plenty nothing to worry about a dry runway and hence auto brake low should be okay that completes our approach items. So one very last thing to do before we start the approach is to look at our fuel, sti uh, fuel situation. Make sure we have uh, still enough fuel um, for our diversion airport. Um, usually when you do regular fuel checks that will be the case because otherwise you would have to make a decision earlier on before even starting the approach. So let's just have a look at the current fuel situation and for that we take the flight plan page again look at our flight plan and so we see we have an estimated fuel on board at touchdown of 4.8 tons required is 4.6 tons so comfortably 200 kilograms above the minimum requirement and how about the time uh, Capno that should be one hour after takeoff. So we'll be at Capno in, let's have a look, 10 past. So in five minutes, 55. So we actually made a four minute um, improvement. So we probably had better wind in the cruising level than expected. Um, so we have 5.1 tons and we should have 5.0 yet. That all adds up, so everything's as planned.
Scanning through the ECAM pages real quickly, looking for the systems all look good. We have a landing altitude of 5,312 feet inserted and the airport elevation 5,355. That's good. So that's checked as well. Electric looks good. Hydraulic quantities look okay. Brakes are cool. Alright, looks fantastic. One more thing I like to do before I start the approach is have a look at the taxi chart, um, have a general plan after vacation of the runway where I need to go. And so our terminal is uh, to the north. And so we'll vacate runway 21 at Foxtrot 3 or Foxtrot 1, depending on how hard we will break. And then it's uh, northbound Charlie, probably. We're going to cross two runways there, 1, 2, and 0, 8. And then we'll go to the terminal area. Just about to start the descent. Always a good idea to look at the minimum sector altitudes, have a general idea about the terrain situation. So we can see high terrain towards the east and um, some also some high terrain here on the uh, western side. However, the eastern side is more critical. Um, we have uh, 11,900 there as our sector altitudes. And uh, towards the west, there is some more uh, buffer, so not quite as critical. On the NAV display, we can see the top of descent arrow approaching, so let's start our descent. And I'm going to choose 11,000 feet for now because that's the waypoint that um, the approach towards runway 03 branches off as well. And who knows, maybe the wind is going to change some more. And um, so we want to be flexible. So first of all, 11,000 feet, but um, we can change that later on to uh, 10,000 feet, which will be the approach altitude at Foxer. Now in the managed descent mode, the autopilot uh, will try to meet all the restrictions that are inserted in the FMS. Should there be a problem, i.e. due to unexpected tailwind or uh, some faulty calculations, then there might be a message like drag required. And in this case, you would use speed brakes to help the autopilot get onto its correct path again. So right now we can see we're pretty much uh, on path as expected and so we just monitor the progress of the uh, flight management guidance system. Center 124.32 see ya. 124.32 see ya JetBlue 711. Marie zero zero Delta Whiskey, depart to Sequoia VOR, heading zero one zero, and I'll be able to approach shortly after. Alright, Sequoia VOR, then heading zero one zero zero to the Whiskey. Albuquerque, good afternoon, JetBlue 711, we're descending via the Kirky 3, runway 21 transition. Chapel 711 Albuquerque Center Roger, Albuquerque at 3004. 3004, Jet Blue 711.
JetBlue 711, contact Albuquerque approach, 123.9. JetBlue 711, 123.9, I think. So. Albuquerque approach, uh, good afternoon, JetBlue 711, passing 210 on the Kirby 3, arrival 21 transition, and uh, information hotel, request the Arnav Yankee runway 21. JetBlue 711, Albuquerque approach, and you're Albuquerque, I'll turn 3003, expect Arnav Yankee runway 21 approach, Fox, sir. 3003, expecting the Yankee uh, 21 approach via Fox, sir, JetBlue 711. Okay, so we are expecting the RNF Yankee 2 1 out of Foxer. So if things are inserted correctly into the FMS. Just watching uh, the descent path, we could see it was slightly above, and uh, the speed is at the top part of the range, and so I'll help along a little bit with the speed brakes. Now we're not very high above the optimum path as we can see here with that uh, magenta circle so we're just coming uh, back onto it just wait a few more seconds and then I'll stow the speed brakes again there we go 15 minutes before landing right about so let's uh, get the passengers strapped in again and passing transition level so let's set this latest QNH and that was reported at 3003. Also set on the co-pilot side. Still monitoring our approach. Next gate, um, 11,000 above, uh, which is fine. However, we have to make sure that the aircraft slows down to 250 feet. And then the important thing is Foxer at 10,000 feet and also max speed 210 knots. And then from there we just follow the programmed um, route and what I'll do now is I will now set <laughs> the uh, final approach altitude 6600 feet and since all the restrictions are checked in the FMS and we are in managed descent the autopilot will meet all the restrictions unless we get too high and then we have to use the speed brakes but at the moment we're right on path. Amra, we have to be at 10,000, um, or not exactly 10,000, but we seem to be a little bit high in the profile again. So we can see that magenta circle is uh, below the, the halfway point again. So we'll use the speed brakes, help the autopilot system. Over there in the distance we can see the airport of Albuquerque. It's a very beautiful clear evening. So now we can see the circle has returned to the center. Just give it a few more seconds and then I'll stow the speed brakes again. Able to find UID 
Seven after Fox are cleared on Yankee, one after Fox cleared the RNF Yankee 2-1 approach, uh, JetBlue 7 one thank you. Okay, so up to now he only said expect, but now we officially got the approach clearance for the RNF Yankee approach, runway 2-1 out of Foxer. And so up to now the clearance limit was Foxer, however with the uh, clearance that we just received we can go now all the way to the runway and then the tower later on will give us the landing clearance itself. Now you can see just in front of the aircraft there is a circle with a magenta D in it and that's where the approach phase automatically activates. And there we go, once you overfly it on the nav path then the approach phase activates automatically otherwise you have to do that yourself if you don't activate the approach phase you have to be careful you cannot use the uh, final approach mode Uh, also, as a workload reduction for the next uh, phase, I'm looking for the tower frequency and I'll pre-select that here in the um, audio control panel. We'll contact uh, Albuquerque Tower at Big Eye. Thank you, JetBlue711. City, Albuquerque, there's the airport. Can't really see the approach uh, runway just yet. Let's just uh, keep on monitoring the autopilot. And we are descending to our final approach altitude now, 6,600 feet. But again, uh, making sure that we maintain all the necessary restrictions. I'm entering now the um, threshold of the arrival runway, so um, Albuquerque runway 21, and I have the straight and distance. I'm selecting flaps 1, help slow down the aircraft. Yeah, so I can see that I'm a bit high in the profile. Um, that can happen, especially when you have tailwind. Selecting flaps 2. Alright, yeah, we have to make sure that we reach the 6,600 feet at Kanye, the final approach point. If we don't cross that at 6,600, um, then usually the final approach mode doesn't activate. And then we have to uh, use some manual modes in the autopilot system. And uh, at low altitude, that becomes a little bit hectic. So we try to avoid that. Right, landing gear down, and let's contact the tower. Hello, Bukoki Tower. Good afternoon. JetBlue 711 at Big Eye for the honor of uh, 2 1 Yankee. JetBlue 711, Albuquerque Tower, your afternoon. Clear to land 2 1, JetBlue 711. Okay, so we fully cleared the land. Let's have a look. Where's the runway? I can see that on the right there. 
So we're on path again. I'm going to reduce speed now to final approach speed. So pressing on that uh, speed knob. Flaps three. Turning on the nose gear lights. And then flaps full. Once that's done, we read the checklist. Here we are, landing checklist, Ekamemo landing no blue. Fully configured, slowing down to the approach speed. And so let's concentrate now on how the autopilot flies the approach. So Kanye 6,600 feet, Alt star, speed mode. Now we press the approach mode. And then you will see that approach nav appears and final blue. And at the descent point at Kanye, final blue will then change into a combined mode. Here it is. And the combined mode now is called final approach. And the autopilot flies the programmed vertical path as well as the lateral path. So you can have a look at uh, two white, two red on the puppies. So very nicely on path. One thousand. One thousand feet is checked. We're stable. So depending on how accurate your updating is uh, regarding the lateral path, um, you might be right on center line, but sometimes, just like in this case, you might be a bit offset. Well, um, if you are visual with the runway, you can do just what I'm doing now. Take out the autopilot and then fly manually. 100 above. Manual thrust. 500. And so from now on, it's just simply visual down to the uh, runway using the puppies. Minimum. Continue. Now the modes revert to heading and vertical speed after the minimum. That's normal. We just continue looking outside if you want. 200. You can ignore the flight directors. Just concentrate on the visual cues outside. 100. Try to be stable at 50 feet. 50, 40, 30, 20. Retard. Retard. 5. A uh, little bit of a flare, but I wanted a, a smooth landing. We have long runway ahead, so we could use the touchdown zone. Right, we have spoilers, uh, reverse, uh, active, and uh, deceleration. So just uh, braking manually, trying to get this uh, exit here. Well, brakes hot. It's not uh, going to happen that quickly in real life. Usually the heat takes its while to get from the inside to the outside of the uh, brake discs and then uh, trigger the warning. Nevertheless, so we're vacating here at Foxtrot 3 and be ready for the taxi clearance once you have vacated. Chapman 711 right turn on Foxtrot 3, Foxtrot northbound to Charlie, hold short, by the way, 1-2 on Charlie. Foxtrot then uh, northbound will join Charlie, hold short 2-1 uh, at Charlie, JetBlue 711. Chapman 711, hold short, runway 1-2, runway 12 at Charlie. Oh, I'm sorry, so runway 12 at Charlie, copy. 
VS and have a look at our taxi routing here. So we'll just continue straight ahead. Jetblue 711 cross runway 12 at Charlie, hold short runway 8. Cross 12 at Charlie will hold short at uh, runway 8, Jetblue 711. So there's our crossing clearance for runway 12. There it is. Gonna switch on the strobe lights again. Since we are crossing an active runway, looking left, looking right, make sure everything is clear. And so we'll continue on Charlie up towards runway. Zero eight. Now, up ahead, you can see the uh, wigwag, I think it's called, uh, so the flashing. Uh, amber caution lights on the taxiway signaling to you that you have to be careful there is a, another runway um, coming up so hopefully we get the clearance in a second to cross otherwise I'm gonna have to stop Chapel 711 on Charlie cross runway 8 can establish frequency off of the ramp have a great day JetBlue 711 on Charlie, we're going to cross runway 8 and then via Alpha to the ramp and I'll stay on your frequency thanks, have a great evening Right, Alpha is going to be the next one to the left, to the ramp. I'm going to switch off the strobe lights now that we're getting clear of the active runway. And then we'll just try to find a parking spot, park and shut down the aircraft. This looks like a good spot, so we're going to turn right here. And then switch off the no gear lights in order not to blind the marshaller. So there he is. Hopefully he's going to give me some signals in a second. So good speed to taxi in is about 5 to 7 knots. And then once you get close, obviously gradually slow down the aircraft. And then come to a complete stop. bit more to the right he's signaling now he says more to the right there we go on center line just follow his signals and there he goes getting close to the stop line and once he crosses the ones then we stop the aircraft slowing down and stop now we're gonna set the parking brake APU is running switch off the engines once that's the case Switch off the transponder now. Switch off the beacon, switch off the seatbelt signs. Get some APU bleed air. Let's have the packs, the air conditioning packs powered. And there we are. That completes the flight from Palm Springs to Albuquerque. Right, so let's uh, read the parking checklist. So the APU bleed is on, yellow eagle pump is off, engines are off, no fuel flow anymore, seat belts are off, which on the uh, dome light here. So what's next? Oh yeah, parking brake is uh, on and radar predictive wind shear is off. That completes the parking checklist and that completes the flight today.
And so I do hope you've enjoyed this uh, video. Again, I try to uh, get as close as possible to real-life procedures. Um, there's uh, not that much difference to what is actually done in the flight decks on an A320 on a flight like this. And so, yes, the flight simulators these uh, days have become extremely realistic. Um, and yes, they can be used for, well, not complete type rating training, but they can be used to help um, getting used to procedures, um, getting used to um, using the autopilot system, the flight management system, and uh, these sort of things. And so if these systems weren't very realistic, um, I would get bored very quickly with them. But you can see that I very much enjoy using these flight sims. Um, and so, yes, you can see that as a compliment from my side to the developers. They have done an amazing job in the last uh, one or two years getting these simulators to the standard that they are at at this very point of time. Of course, in the future, they will improve further, and so there's exciting times ahead of us uh, flight simmers. One feature that I'm uh, really looking forward to is the shared flight deck, and once that feature is implemented, that'll get us even closer to the real world. I'm personally looking very much forward to that, and I hope that many more developers will see the importance of this feature and start implementing that as a standard feature for their aircraft. Now, before I leave, let me say a very big thank you to all of my amazing supporters here on YouTube and especially on Twitch. I'm very much looking forward to many, many more years of sharing my passion for flying with all of you. So until the next time, take care and as always, happy landings.